we've got a problem, which is it's better. Well, this isn't gonna work, I need to clear this up. Okay, let's bring you in for a closer look. This corner and the opposite one over there. So when that corner's down, there's about that much. The whole two fingers worth of gap at this corner. It's got a little bit of a bow in the middle, but that should clamp you out easily enough. We've got some winding sticks here, which is just two bits of wood, the same size, absolutely flat, parallel edges, so that they line up. One can hide the other if you put them on a board, and they're just different colours to so it's a bit more visible. So I can cut them. Detect cut and twist with them. What you do is look down um, a bit like that, and then if one doesn't cover up the other, you can see that there's twist in the board. Okay, let's back up a minute and just make sure we're on the same page when it comes to warpage, terminology, theory type stuff. Let's start with just a straight board. You'll have to excuse my drawing. It's a s fairly straight. This is more of a cupped type board. So that's is bent across the width. There's the drain direction and when it dries the face here shrinks more than the outside face so it cuts. This next one's going to be a bowed board so you see a lot of these as shelves where there's only two supports either end and a heavy load in the middle and over time it bows down. It also happens when you cut boards and relieve stress and they can just tend to bow. Or if they've been seasoned on a wobbly surface or without heavy weight on top or something like that. And finally we've got, it's a little bit harder to draw, a twisted board which is essentially sort of spiralled along its length. Oh dear, it's quite tricky to draw. Obviously, that's a bit exaggerated. And I'm not even sure how to work out these, what bits you see now. Okay, well, that's a twisted board anyway. There we go, it's kind of like this. I'm sure you get the idea. Twisted. <laughs> This type of board I'm going to struggle to draw, it's all on the same plane, so if you were to lay it flat on a flat surface it wouldn't rock around at all like a twisted board, but it's bent along its width length, that isn't making any sense, along that bit it's... Ah. <laughs> Anyway, if people say that that is a crooked board, it has a crook. If you looked at it end on, there was the end grain and this little bit, you'd see it kind of bending round. So the end grain's here and then that's edge grain. Here we go. So if you imagine this is a big board, essentially it would look like this. but still be flat. Okay, enough chit chat. That was a random tangent. Let's get back to it. Now this board was made with the chainsaw mill and it's already been dried, ripped down the middle, planed, and then glued back together. But since it's been in its new location, it's still managed to warp this new twist. Now I'm guessing that's just because it's a very dry room. As it's already down to the thickness that I want it, I don't want to remove any more material. So I'm making these stress relieving cuts down the length of the board. And for this I'm just using a track saw with guide. The guide's not really necessary, but you do end up using it for most things when you've got one. 
and I'm cutting him about two thirds to three quarters of the way through the board. So leaving about a quarter of the thickness there. I'm just sanding the underside wise upside down, just get rid of that glue line. Okay, we're back in the workshop. So just to show you exactly what we're doing, because it's quite hard to see with that big board. I've got a little scrap here. I'm going to do the same thing on the table saw. So the first thing I'm going to need to do is to remove this splitter. Splitter removed. Set the part. And that looks about right. It's not crucial. Make sure it's not going to come through. All I'm doing is cutting a bunch of grooves in this little scrap. And we can see how it affects its resistance to being twisted. Just to state the obvious, you would never do this with a twisted board on the table or so. Without a splitter, anything but a straight board is going to lead to kickback city. That should suffice just to demo this. So this is what we're left with. And as you can see, I can now flex it. I can adjust this surface with really not much pressure. I'm able to twist the board much more. The obvious downside to this is the weakening of the board. So as this is a scrap. Yeah, but if you imagine that area was filled, to get that amount of movement, this top layer would have to expand so much more that that split would happen way sooner. You can actually get, if you look at that arch, it's like a very tight arch without the splitting. So you can get way more movement by relieving the stress this way. Kind of looks like a wooden heat sink. We are set up here with our cuts and our little biscuits. So let's give it a try. Wait a minute, there's a great opportunity for a tangent here. I'm not ashamed to admit it, I don't own a biscuit jointer, never have. Uh, I've bought the bought biscuits a handful of times and never been very pleased. If you're a woodworker, it seems pretty easy to make your own and superior ones at that. So I'm a bit stumped as to why so many people seem to like the expensive bought ones. Let's talk about the differences. So the chamfered edges definitely help in terms of get sliding the boards together. These don't have them. But we're going to be putting them in. So they go in, this one's going in easy enough, they vary in. But its strength, it's just not very strong. And most of the fibres are going that way and there's a few going across and that way in this cross direction is where you want most of the strength so in comparison this bad boy can make it fit just right now. Yes, you're going to have to take it from me, but that is much harder to snap off. The other problem with having the grain running that way is that as you sandwich boards together, if it's a tight fit or they don't line up perfectly, this grain tends to ruffle up much easier and then gets jammed in the in the glue line, which can create you know problems in terms of getting the boards fully together. This is the router bit I use to make the, the old grooves. I'm not 100% sure what you'd call it. Maybe a bearing guided slotter or a groover or something like that. Anyway, this is how it works. Really dead simple. And as long as the plunge depth is kept constant, then it registers them really nicely. Let's mount this top and see if it fits already. I've got the lining up interests here. 
so with these things you've always got to get your daily dose of wiggle jiggling things together. But that was nicely in place, just a question of clamping it down with some screws and checking out whether it's removed the twist. It took some jiggling round of the frame and such, but I'm fairly happy. You can see the winding sticks there, bottoms pretty much lining up with the top. And if I can control the tripod, <laughs> you can see it pretty much. There's a sliver there, and then it's all disappearing, so I'm, I'm ready to call that good enough. There you have it, it's relatively twist free now, the slabs are kept together nicely with those biscuits without a lip. We're ready to move on to some of the cupboards. I hope you found some bits of that interesting, it's just one way of dealing with twist without having to plane more material off and retaining most of the longitudinal strength. Let me know what you think, if you've got any great insights about biscuit joints or are I missing something crucial in the world of biscuit related shenanigans then just drop a comment below. Until next time, thanks for watching.